this uh, message I'm calling Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And happiness, the pursuit of happiness is the will of God. The problem with it is that we have perverted the pursuit of happiness and made it mostly a carnal thing that many do outside of the will of God. But God is the one who envisioned the happiness of the human heart. And the only place we will find our spirits exhilarated is in the place of complete obedience. Now what I mean by that, I don't mean the attainment of it. I mean the decision for it. I made a decision to obey God in every area of my life, and there are still issues that I'm not fully broke, uh, have the victory and the breakthrough in. But the Lord looks at us in the journey, before we attain it, He considers us to be wholehearted while still in the process and the journey of making the decision to do it. Some people have an idea of wholeheartedness that it's that day 10 years from now, 20 years from now, it's in the faint, distant future where they wake up one day and all the issues are settled and then they will finally be wholehearted and what they have confused is wholehearted They've confused the idea of wholeheartedness with total maturity. And beloved, we can be wholehearted today with unsettled issues in our life. We can be wholehearted right now before we get the breakthrough in every area. Our wholeheartedness doesn't begin when the victory is complete, but the victory begins with the decision to be wholehearted. And that's what we're talking about today. And the decision for wholeheartedness, I'm talking about a real quality decision, not a theoretical one. That is the place where our spirit is exhilarated with Jesus. Even before we fully have a breakthrough, we can be exhilarated and fascinated with Jesus in our spirit long before the breakthrough comes. You can say holiness or you can say wholeheartedness or you can say fascination with Jesus. It's the same thing. You can call it the first commandment being restored to first place. The anointing to love God with all of your heart. That's a supernatural power. The anointing to love God with all of your heart. The first commandment, you shall love the Lord your God being restored to first place in the church, that is called holiness. Because, beloved, this may be a new idea, but when we're wholehearted and we're connected to the Holy Spirit, even before we have the breakthrough of maturity, even before the issues are all settled, when the commitment is there, we begin to feel, I'm talking about feel, an exhilaration and a fascination with Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing I love more than feeling God in my spirit. And in this book, The Pleasures of Loving God, I talk about the superior pleasures of the gospel. The greatest pleasures that God created for the human spirit is the pleasure when God reveals God to the human spirit. God is the author of pleasure. He's the author of physical pleasure. The devil has counterfeited some of God's physical pleasures. He is the author of emotional pleasures. And the devil comes in and perverts some of that. He's the author of several other pleasures. I don't want to go into all that right now. But the greatest pleasures available to the human spirit are spiritual pleasures. When God reveals God to the human spirit, it exhilarates us like nothing else in all of creation. Beloved, that's called holiness. That's where the pursuit of a vibrant heart, the pursuit of happiness, is in this connectedness with the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Roman numeral 2. The clearest description, Roman numeral 2, the Sermon on the Mount, the core values of the kingdom, the clearest description in the Bible for purity, for wholeheartedness, for loving God and loving people, or you can use the word holiness, is the Sermon on the Mount. 
There's nowhere in the Word of God where it is more precisely and concisely laid out. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. There it is. The Sermon on the Mount, it's three chapters. It's Jesus' greatest teaching. I call it the Constitution of the Kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount is the litmus test to measure our success in life. When I stand before God, He's not going to ask me how big my conferences were or how many people listened to my teaching on TV. He's going to ask me about the size of my heart, not the size of my checkbook or the size of my conferences. When I stand before God, He's not going to say, how much money did you have? Or how big was your ministry? He's going to say, my son, how big was your heart when you were on the earth? And it is defined by the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We really want to become completely immersed in the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. Your foundational calling in life, my foundational calling, is not ministry, that's second. The number one calling that is before you from the Holy Spirit's point of view is that you would live out the eight Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of people are saying, what's my calling? What's my calling? What they mean is, what is my occupation? Or what is my ministry assignment? That's a very valid question. What is my occupation going to be? When you're 20 years old, that's a great question. And what is my ministry assignment? That's a great question. And of course, the next huge one, who am I going to marry? That's a great question. That, those are not bad. Here's the problem. That's not the main question that the Holy Spirit wants you to ask. The main question He wants you to ask is how you can effectively fill your highest calling and your highest calling is the issue of your own heart with God. Those other issues are very important, but they are second. We need to be consumed with our primary calling, and the Lord is going to measure Mike Bickle's life on one standard. What's the Word of God? But just to summarize it, He's going to look at the eight Beatitudes, and He's going to measure my life by the eight Beatitudes, not by the size of my conference ministry. There will be, there will be preachers that fill stadiums, and there will be others that will be far greater than they are when they stand before God, who they were completely unheard of during their life. We need to make the number one focus of our life, our primary calling, for our heart to grow and to be great in God's sight. Now that might be a, a new idea to some of you. Right after Jesus taught the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, right here in verse 19, the same chapter, He calls every single believer and invites them to the place of greatness. Now this is a teaching that throws off a lot of people. But remember, it's Jesus who's the one that gave it. Here's what he said. Whoever breaks the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so, this person shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does the least of these commandments and teaches other people, this man or this woman shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Beloved, these eight Beatitudes need to be the central focus of your entire life on the earth. When you stand before God, you will be measured by these attitudes in your life.